It's me, Erin. Thanks for joining us on the More Love Podcast. Do not tell Rebecca, but this podcast is about empathy. She likes people to think she's dead inside, but the truth is she's a big time feeler who has truly helped me uncover that empathy is my superpower. Here she comes. Hey, bestie. Hi, love. What are you doing? Oh, just getting ready to host a podcast. A podcast? About what? Oh, life. Our life as best friends who are more like sisters. Ah, yay! I love us and I can't wait to share our stories with the world. Especially the ones that involve us pushing each other, right? To be our most authentic selves. Oh, man. Okay. Scott goes from zero to pissed in 14 seconds. I know. I almost asked the pendulum. I almost wrote let's down during our him. interim. Let's ask, let's ask the Scott questions <laughs> from the pendulum. Will Is Scott, Scott gonna fire be us? to the whole episode. Oh, it says yes. Oh, yes. Will Scott fire us? Is Scott going to get oh, over? Oh, look at it swinging. Look oh, at it swinging. Oh, yes, whatever. Whoa. Whatever. Scott, How am I going to fire you? Whatever. <laughs> Scott's not going to know what to do with himself if we are not coming in here every How single week. How many times do we text him and say, Scott, get on Zoom? <laughs> He's on a fucking ladder. He's, He's on a like, ladder. What do you want? Microphones <laughs> up on some church with stained glass. And we're like, Scott, we got to show you this thing that we did. I cannot. Scott, why do you go from zero to, to pissed in 14 seconds? It's called stress. No. <laughs> it's called perfectionism. It's it's called why everything worked fine until it didn't work. Does it always end up working got, out, Scott? We got a guest waiting for us. Does it? Christy's awesome. And she's I'm, fine. She's not pissed. She's from Canada. They don't not, get pissed there. I'm also not set up for me to be on the show. Right okay. Now. So and oh, so now you're pissing him off even more. No, <laughs> he's fine, and it's fine. Do we all? Is everyone clear? This is Scott. It's not a Scott imposter back there, right? <laughs> Scott, does it always work out? Do you always make it work out? So what part of you yeah. at zero to 10 seconds isn't thinking to yourself, well, this might be stressful right now, but it's fine. It always works out. Yeah, I don't think that way. I think I'm aware. <laughs> I think, holy shit, I'm screwing up what what I am supposed to be delivering to my clients. And does, here's a quick question. Rebecca, do you ever, have you ever, will you ever feel Oh my God, what a screw up Scott is. I mean, I think that in my head, but I'll never say that. You do not. <laughs> You're an asshole. Here he goes again. Guy can't. No, we got him right back on the train. I was trying to get him off. Hey, Scott, on a scale of one to 10, when you see our names on the list of coming in, are you like, oh God, here we go. On a scale from one to 10, it's one. That, that means like, that's the best. <laughs> One is means number one. Well, yeah, your one guest, is you can't, your guest can't see me, so it's probably really awkward. She her. knows who you are, Scott. You're a part of the podcast. <laughs> She's fine. Christy's it's fine. Basically a threesome. Ew. <laughs> I mean, it is now today. It's the foursome. That's right. We got Christy here too. Anyway, Scott, <laughs> do we need to do any more of this session, or can we work on that? Because when you go from zero to fourteen, I don't think you're mad at yourself. I think you're mad at me. And I don't oh, no, like I'm how that feels. At, I know you're not now, but I do. I was not mad at you at all. I'm, I mad, think, at, I'm mad at the equipment not working. And then you get mad at yourself. No, I, was, I wasn't mad at myself. I, if, if anything, I was mad at myself for overreacting. Okay. I love that self-awareness right there. Yeah. That's fantastic. And is that necessary <laughs> to be able to be that mad at yourself with your overreact, your overreacting? Huh? He hates you. He stopped listening to you 20 minutes ago. <laughs> God. All right. Whatever, Scott. Yeah, Get on. with the program. Move on. Ready? We got a guest today. Yes, you do. Snack and bacon at these. Oh, snack and bacon. I heard Evan say snack and bacon. <laughs> he's really pissed at Evan. Yeah, I know, because he's talking about snack and bacon. Oh, no, Evan. I heard him. All of a sudden, I heard in the background, <laughs> someone someone threw like a cup across the room, and I'm like, whoa, okay. Evan, bro Evan went to Duncan, and he brought some snack and bacon I back, and he's trying to No, he didn't. Him. Stop no, it. No, he didn't. He no. also didn't bring you any snack and bacon? This is the second time today people have gone to Dunkin' Donuts and not brought you something? I brought him. I got him. Oh, snack that's and bacon. Evan. That's, that's so nice. nice. Evan. That's way why to, he's way to bring us something. That is, yeah. That's why it's, yeah. It's the only no, reason he that he, did. he actually has it together. Snack and bacon. You want it? Yeah. Oh, that's really sweet. That's nice. It's because he was 
inspired by us. You know who didn't? You. <laughs> and you, not only that, but you got yourself a snack and bacon, you got me a snack and bacon, and you got yourself a fat bastard sandwich. I know. And then you were like, hey, Scott, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Sorry, you Scott. You have a fat bastard producer as well. Oh, That's fine. Well, moving on. That's fine. You? But we All have right. a guest today. Yes. We are really excited. Christy Holt is with us today. Hi, Christy. Hi, ladies. Super excited to be here. Yes, we're really excited to have you. We, I'm going to give you a little fair warning here, okay? We have had a lot of guests in the past. When I say a lot, I mean four and <laughs> maybe five. And um, we really enjoy having guests. But one of the things we realized on one of our recent guest episodes was that Rebecca is not her true self. <laughs> Don't when say that. We have, oh, let me rephrase that. Rebecca struggles with opening her mouth <laughs> when we have a guest, okay? And Rebecca, part of what makes this podcast this podcast is the fact that Rebecca always thinks something very different than I do. She has very different opinions. She's much more in your face than I am. And I will have this conversation with you today, Christy, and it will feel like a therapeutic session. At the end of it, it'll just be really beautiful between the two of us. And then at the end, Rebecca will be like, well, here's all the things I was thinking during the session. And I had to say to her, <laughs> Say it on the podcast. <laughs> That's why people pay the big bucks to listen to us. <laughs> so this is fair warning, Christy, that I have prepped Rebecca that she needs to authentically, which is really apropos for today's session, right? Be Perfect. herself and ask her questions and put herself out there okay. when questions come up for her. That said, Christy, I have no clue what's about to happen here. And so I want you Perfect. to know you have a friend in me. In she also doesn't ever someone. prep me with the topics. Right. Because that's how it, you get true, genuine responses. Yeah. Because it's raw in the moment. I literally have, I just knew your name. Right. I know nothing. <laughs> exactly. So. so that's just a little heads up. You, you totally seem like someone who can completely hold your own in all conversations, which I absolutely love. But I want you to know <laughs> if you need a little support, I'm here for you because we do not I know am not, what come she's on. about. You're to acting like I'm going to. Unhinged. No. Unhinged. No. Start us uh, off, girlfriend. I'm here for you. That's right. Love it, Christy. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> so we will start our session. I still don't know why we you call, call it We call them that. sessions because. They are. Because you're a therapist. <laughs> um, so um, we have brought our intentions to the deck today for our conversation with you. And again, I know nothing about what we're going to talk about. So I just brought my intention to the deck to say, guide us in this conversation and show us some things. And so I pulled the two of cups, which is partnership. Okay. Cool. And they are the Jesus cup chalices. Okay. And there's two of them. Okay. Should be three. So we can all have wine. Yes. But it's just going right. to be me and Christy because you don't get it. <laughs> right. Because you know and, I can't handle it anyway. <laughs> right. There's a dolphin, which is you. Okay, good. Yeah. What am I doing in there? <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> What's the wonderful? Yeah, we're going to do. Really great. We're going to do the. Scott, give us your best dolphin yeah. impression. Go. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> really good. Wow. Whoa. 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 Time to head to the vet. So, speaking of dolphin sounds. <laughs> <laughs> what are when, you about to say? When you and I went to Disney World this past time at our um, Christmas party, Merry Christmas party, yeah. we went to the Monsters, Inc. Laugh House or whatever the hell that's yeah. called. Yeah. And did they not shine the light on me and yeah. make me pretend to be a reindeer and do reindeer sounds? <laughs> yes. Right. In front of the whole studio. In front of the entire yeah. studio. They're like, so, what's your name? You're like, Rebecca. They're like, Rebecca, why don't you be a reindeer? <laughs> You're like, do what? Huh? Okay. Yeah. So I had to put my hands up and I had to make reindeer sounds. And I was like. I don't even know what a reindeer does. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, okay, two of cups. Partnership. This card predicts love, equality, and a meaning of hearts and minds, which benefits all of your relationships from friendships to romance. It also reveals a commitment or promise, such as an engagement or marriage or emotional investment in a shared project. Hmm. This is a healing card. So if your relationship has tested you recently, it reveals that all will be well. You can expect someone close to you to show their love Know that you are trustworthy and dependable. So the advice is to appreciate the love and trust in your relationships, which is so interesting because Erin's been a royal bitch for a while <laughs> and she just disclosed that she got herself some help and now she's all much better. So <laughs> and now you believe in our relationship That's right. again. That's right. I'm back. That's right. <laughs> I'm back. 
<laughs> I'm back. And this is absolutely perfect because yep. a lot of what Christy is going to be talking about today is authenticity. It's going to mm. be talking about your best self. She's going to talk a little bit about an experience that she had surviving a difficult divorce and co-parenting. Mm. She's going to be talking about personal boundaries and people pleasing and just a lot of the stuff that we talk about on this podcast in terms of empathy. Um, a lot of our listeners, Christy, are in the helping professions in some way, shape, or form. They're very caring, loving, wonderful people. Um, and one of the questions that has continued to come up with this group of people is, yes, I want to embrace my loving, wonderful self. And at the same time, I don't want to be a pushover. I don't want to constantly get railroaded by other people. How do we know when enough is enough? Like, How do I embrace that feminine, wonderful energy that I bring to the table, but also make sure that I'm honoring my authentic self. So mm -hmm. we specifically chose you, Christy, to come <laughs> she in says we. to talk about, yeah, you know, it's me, Christy. She's, <laughs> Rebecca doesn't even know what Facebook is, let alone find you on the podcast group. But um, so you refer to yourself as the happiness hussy. Is that right? Yeah. Tell yeah, us a little you. bit about that and a little bit about you. Yeah, you know, honestly, the the title Happiness Hussy sort of came about by accident. My cousin was sort of teasing me for being so positive and kind of said it in a sarcastic way. But I was like, hell yes, I am claiming that and I'm going to repurpose Love the word it. happiness. Well, not the word happiness, but the word hussy along yeah. with happiness <laughs> because I am uh, on a mission to ultimately spread happiness across the world and it's perfect that this card came up, actually, because I generally focus my my work on relationships because everything that we experience in this world is, in fact, a relationship. And at the core of that is ultimately the relationship that we have with ourself. And that is actually the cornerstone to creating the happy life, business, impact, relationships, you know, everything that you want to create in your life. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would say... It takes people, women specifically, an incredibly long time to get to that one point realization that you just said. It's all yeah. about relationships, but it starts with the relationship with ourself. How did you arrive at that place? How did you get there? You know, I went through a, a pretty crummy relationship with uh, my ex-husband and ultimately it wasn't a, about him. I mean, of course he was part of it. But ultimately, what I really can recognize now looking back was that this was the relationship that I had with myself was causing most of the problems in my relationship. And I had this sort of like, holy shit moment, if you will. Apologies if we're not supposed no, to swear on. No, we're on good with screen. it. Yep. <laughs> okay. Bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> good to know. I'm, I might throw a few more in there. Sometimes <laughs> words just are, we need more zhuzhing. That's, so that's mm -hmm. right. <laughs> uh, but I had this holy shit moment. Like I was in my relationship and I was not happy. And I was looking at all of the problems that I was seeing around me in my life, in my marriage with my partner, and I forgot to look at myself. And so I had this holy shit moment, like, oh my God, wait a minute. I'm the common denominator in every one of my problems. Mm. I'm there. And, you know, channeling a little Taylor Swift here, like, I'm the problem. It's me. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, it's me. Oh, it's me. And then I realized, well, hold up a minute, because if I'm the common denominator, I'm involved in all of them. I can also be the common solution. And so I really started to shift my focus onto things that actually can make a fucking difference. And that's yeah. changing me. When you were noticing that you were the common denominator, were you noticing that you were a common denominator in a negative a way? Like, were you mm -hmm. in some ways like um, negatively drawing things to yourself or in what way were you the common denominator? Yes and no, depending on the situation. I mean, ultimately, I just realized I am the, the staple person in all of these issues. And so if I'm the common thread, right, there's something to be looking at for myself. And yes, I absolutely, looking back now, I can see that I was, I was doing a lot of complaining. I was doing a lot of venting. I know that, you know, and I give myself grace for this because, in fact, when I was complaining and venting, it was because I didn't feel heard. Like, it's not like I had a, you know, a big, you know, I, it, did, it didn't really benefit me, but I just wasn't feeling heard, which is why I continued to do it. And I didn't see anything changing. And then it slowly dawned on me like, well, hold up a minute. I'm doing a lot of complaining, but that's actually not 
fruitful. It's not actually helping anything. It's actually just keeping me focused on the problems. And now I have, I have 14, four teen boys, not 14, not that's too many, four <laughs> teenage boys. Oh my God. The four yeah. is, is plenty. And uh, I tell them a lot because they, they will bicker a lot and they really get harping on the problem. And I have to remind them really regularly and myself, we're human. We forget so easily. So cute like that. That, you know, if we focus on the problem, we experience more of the problem. And if we focus on finding a creative solution, we actually free up brain space that otherwise would have been wasted. And so if we want to be at our greatest capacity for creating the life and the love and the impact that we desire in the world, we've got to focus on the one thing that we actually have the power to change. And that is ourselves. So whether that be the way that you're responding and engaging and creating the situation or simply reacting to it, right? Moving yourself from a reactive response to a more intentional ch chosen response is actually you standing in your power. We don't always have the ability to change what's going on around us, but we do always have the power to choose how we are going to show up in that moment. Even Very though much appreciate. sometimes it sure doesn't freaking feel like it. Uh, right. I very much appreciate the fact that you're teaching your teenage sons yeah. this concept because I, I just don't have a lot of faith in humanity or I don't have yeah. fa a lot of faith in the way people our age are raising their children today because they're raising their children to be victims, to be catered to, to not take accountability for anything. And then they become the adults. And this is why we have these problems in my mind, because I raise my children very similarly to you. And you get to choose your response no matter what. I mean, as simple as getting a gift at Christmas time, you choose your response. You choose the lens you're looking at it through. And that is a lifelong lesson that I don't think a lot of people really truly understand. So I very much appreciate that you're te teaching not only your children, your teenage children, but boys. Yeah. And, you know, I think what what's really tricky is that when when we're in the muck at times, mm -hmm. we don't feel like we have a choice. And so mm -hmm. I want any listeners out there to recognize that I see you. I get that when you're right in the shit pile, it doesn't feel like you you have an available choice. It feels like the world is just happening and there's nothing you can do. However, that's not the truth. And the only reason that you're feeling that way is because your survival response mechanism has kicked in. It has literally put your brain on power save mode, right? We're, we're trying to be efficient and like, don't die. Like that's the only, it's not re reasonable. It's not rational, but that's what our brain does. It's like, don't die. Right. So it focuses on survival and any other creative, helpful, logical solutions are kind of pushed aside while we're going through this initial survival response. And so ultimately the key here is learning to navigate that survival response, anticipating it, it's going to come up from time to time and giving yourself the resources and tools to navigate through that so that you can find your way to that choice because it is always available. You know, it's funny. We talk a lot <clears throat> about how your brain just is different when it comes to empathy and how you view the world. And what you're saying to me, I do not have that part of my brain that goes into survival mode. When something happens, I'm immediately like, okay, here, we're going to, we're going to shift right now. There is you, there's not a lot of times in my life that I can say that I was in a woe is me or a, um, I'm I, every I'm the victim. I'm, you know, like people need to help me mentality. And I'm I actually view one of my superpowers as immediately being able to pivot and move in a completely dif different direction and erase all that other stuff. Is it erased? Y in a lot of ways. Yeah. Right. So this is so fascinating. I freaking love this because this whole time that we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. you two are on the same exact page. 100%. Okay. I'm way back at the starting line. <laughs> I know. Because it takes you forever. I, I'm not sure. You guys have gone from <laughs> 20 to the age of 55 yeah. in learning lessons in the last seven minutes. And I'm over here way back at the part where she's at survival mode. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, survival. Let's think about survival. So this whole time I'm sitting here... I. 
everything you're saying, Christy, I'm like, I love that. That sounds really great. But I'm not positive if I'm on board with it or buy into it or can understand it because I've not connected it enough with my own personal experience. So as you're talking, I swear to you For guys, the first time in guys, all of these podcasts, I'm like, yeah, I'm welcome. all in. And your face is the one that's like, get like, your shit ooh, together. Go. Get your face Give together. Give me a minute. Yeah. Give me a minute. Where? Right? But let me tell you what I got it. Let me, I'll get there. Maybe, I know. Hopefully by the end of the freaking show, but Maybe. let me just get there for a minute. So what I can relate with Christy is, we talked in the last episode, otherwise known as session, about how I very much can relate with being in survival mode, but not even recognizing that as me being in survival mode. So Hmm. for me, I think a lot of what I've done in life has been to lessen myself, to decrease my sensitivity, to fake it till I make it, to allow myself to accept partners who don't have the same level of communication skills, um, to allow myself to say, well, it's okay to have all of these friends around me and to give to them if I'm not getting back at the same depth. But the reason that I've been doing that, which is a very recent acknowledgement for me, that's what I said takes me a long time to get here, is because if I did not do that, I would never be in a relationship. I would never have friends. I would constantly be lonely. I'd constantly be living at a standard where I was expecting people to give back at the same level of intensity and connection, and I would be incredibly lonely. And so my excuse, my survival tactic, because I also noticed that I was the common denominator. I'm like, I'm always helping other people. I'm always giving more of myself to to everyone until I can't give any more, and then I still give more. I'm constantly surrounding myself with people who need help in some way. I'm constantly choosing partners who in some way, shape, or form either need me or are um, not to the level that I need them to be. And it's not for lack of not wanting those things. It's for having looked everywhere I could possibly imagine to find it, never finding it, and then feeling like I'm going to be alone for the rest of my life. I don't mean to say that I'm settling or that I have settled, but that I was in this survival place without realizing I was there until very recently having read the book Codependent No More and coming off of my Prozac, which we talked about in the last session, and really getting to a place where I was like, wow, I can be me and I can authentically resonate with who I am as a person And recognize that there's been some things I've been doing in a survival capacity to lessen the feeling and the brunt of what that is so that I didn't have to feel X, Y, and Z. Those two things can coexist. But I'm telling you, it took me 42 years of my life to get there. So that's how I can relate with that. Now you two fill in. Are you talking about the same thing I am or are you just like eons ahead of where I am right now? Well, you know, I, I I have lots lots of personal experience with people pleasing and perfectionism, which sounds a little bit like what what you're describing there. Yeah. And I think that here's the real rub of it is that empathic people who are sensitive people who have a heart to give, and I generally think that this is most humans to a degree. Some of us more so than others. We want to make others around us happy. We want to love and give and nurture the people in our lives. That's a natural desire. Now that's, that's not a problem. That's actually, I think, you know, the way nature made us because we are not meant to live alone. We are meant to live in community. The problem lies when we don't have boundaries and we are consistently over giving and then we feel resentful, we feel frustrated, we feel unseen, we feel lonely, we feel like we don't have anyone. And this is actually kind of by our own doing because we are, first of all, in the entire act of people pleasing is in, now hold on for the whole ride here, it is sort of a form of manipulation. Now, not with a negative intent, 
I know that none of none of these people have a negative intent. They actually just genuinely want the people around them to be happy. But there is this deep need, probably from childhood trauma, from not being seen or heard or loved. And this need comes out in a way to seek this validation, this approval, this love, this acceptance from other people. Now, again, it's not intentional. Most of the time, we don't have a fucking clue that we're doing it. It's just happening. So we're seeking this from external sources. We're looking to people around us to validate us, to say, you're okay, you're worthy, you're, you know, worth accepting, you're, you have value. And the, the real problem here is that, first of all, you're typically contorting yourself and giving not out of a genuine desire to give every time, because if you're giving with an expectation of receiving a certain response, right, you're yep. not giving freely. You are giving, it's a contractual exchange that the other person doesn't have a fucking clue they're involved in, essentially. And so it is this sort of form of manipulation, which I know people get real squeamish around the word manipulation, but again, sure. no ill intent, but you are trying to elicit a certain response or a certain outcome. It might even be avoiding conflict, right? It can be really sneaky. So the problem is, is if we are not ourselves, if we are not authentically ourselves, we are never giving anyone the opportunity to see us for who we truly are. And what we want at the deepest core of our being is to feel like we belong, to feel as though we have value, to be loved and accepted for who we are. And yet if we're wearing masks and we're people pleasing and we're over giving and we're doing all of these things to effort to get people to love us, we are not actually being authentically ourselves. And so there's always going to be this little part that says, well, if they knew the real me, they might not feel this way. They might leave. If they knew what I really felt, they might not like me. And so there's this sort of fear of abandonment and this fear of not being loved that permeates all of our behaviors because it's such a core belief running deep within us that it can't not affect the way that we're showing up in the world. So ultimately we do need to figure out who we are. And stop right there. Hey, it's Scott coming to you from inside the bubble. How do you like the interview so far? It's pretty interesting, right? Well, the More Love Podcast is going to be switching over to a subscription-based service. I mean, Rebecca's got to pay for those hair extensions in some way, right? So um, at this point, this is where, if you're a free viewer, this is where the interview would end. There'd be a little discussion afterwards, and that would be the end of the podcast. But I figured, they said, you know, cut it off. I said, no. Rebecca, Aaron, let me take care of this. And so I said, let's show people what it would be like had they subscribed. So what you're going to see from this point on is all the extra stuff if you were a subscriber of what we're going to call Even More Love. It's an extra feature that's going to be available to people who like to pony up for even more love. What's coming next is what you will be missing if you don't subscribe. Now back to the show. And when I was back in my marriage, I suffered, I call it very lovingly, just a momitis, which essentially is to say, I didn't know who I was outside of being my kid's mom. You know, I was in all the other parents' cell phones as Jaden's mom. But did they know my first name even? I don't even know. Right. And so I really lost track of who I was and absolutely motherhood changes us in the most incredible, amazing ways. And I am not, I'm not suggesting that we can go back to a time before that. That's not possible. We're always evolving. However, there is space in motherhood for us to discover who we are as an individual person, you know, without the labels, without the, the titles, without the job descriptions, but just at our core. And what I discovered about myself in that time was at my core, I am love. And I wasn't honoring that love within when I was overgiving and people pleasing and trying to measure up and not holding boundaries and hanging on for dear fucking life with my fingernails just to survive. Hmm. Now I need to know. Now I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I knew it. Do you see my daggers come out? Yep. Here, here, here we go. Here, 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 here we go. Because I love every single thing she just said. Now, 100%. now she switched to my wavelength. Now she's going slow enough for me to be able to understand and get in depth. And how are you feeling? I mean, I feel great, except for the fact that I... And I don't know how to describe it. Like, I figured all of this out in high school. I figured out I'm not a people pleaser. I am not going to pretend I'm not putting on a mask. I am not going to be somebody who I'm not going to be. I remember distinctly, I was a, uh, we were very active in our church, Lutheran. And when you're Lutheran, you become, you get confirmed in 10th grade. And the pastor was talking to us, girls and boys, and he was, describing what we should wear because in catholic you wear the, mm-hmm. the white like mini bride outfit whatever like when you're getting your first communion whatever and he said boys um you'll wear a suit or a shirt and tie and girls you'll wear a dress i immediately went home and i bought a suit i bought a man's suit hmm. and i wore it to get confirmed in a church and not anybody was going to tell me i wasn't going to do that interesting no one. I love that I'm, story. I'm 15. I, I got my hair cut into a pixie cut. Wow. <laughs> yeah. When I was 16 and everybody called me a lesbian. I didn't care. Scott, I'll be sending you that picture yeah. just so we're Go ahead. really clear. Go ahead and call me a lesbian. I don't care. I don't need to have friends. Like I had friends and I had people in my life, but I am not a people collector. It is, I don't care if I raise my hand and I say something that you don't like, how did you get that way? I've always been that way. I think I was born that way. My mom tried to change me. She's like, you cannot say things like that. And I'm like, why? Because it might hurt someone's feelings or make them think a little bit differently. She's like, they may not like you. I'm like, and? So you don't have any fear no. associated with loneliness? No. You know, I you think that's actually on a incredible. I'm not going to live alone on a mountain. I have, I have the people in my life that I want in my life. But how did you get those yeah. people? By being me. <laughs> you either want to be around me and you want to learn more and you want to connect or you don't. I don't need it's to okay. convince you to be a part of my life because that's too much work and effort. And it's not who Amen. I am. I'm not going to go to a class to learn how to get a job and society say, you need to dress this way. You need to not make that person feel, you know, in a job interview, um, threatened by you, this, that, and the other. Well, what? No, I'm going to wear a dress. I'm not wearing a suit, which is ironic. I'm wearing a suit to my confirmation, (laughs) but I, I have never owned a, a blazer since then. And I have never owned a pair of dress pants and I will never put those two things together ever. I will go to a job interview with my six inch heels and my pencil skirt. And you're either going to like it or not, because when I show up to work and work for you, that's what I'm going to look like. Period. You know, this is this is the picture of complete self-worth, right? It's Which is ironic because I don't you I but I don't feel that way. I don't look in the mirror and, and say, man, you're really nailing it. <laughs> like, that's not Why how not? I just. Well, this is this is what's confusing to me. This is where I'm mm-hmm. over here assessing the entire situation. I know, but I always Christy, felt like that. I have personally mm-hmm. worked on Rebecca's <laughs> self confidence. Yes, with my own bare hands. Yes, because I don't view myself as a self confident person. Fifteen out of the twenty years. Yes, that is that the is first true. five years. I was just stunned the whole time. I was just confused. <laughs> I was just like, ah, what am I getting Because yeah, I'm, I'm a wild, I'm a wild <laughs> She's card. She's a wild card. Yeah. For the last 15 years. Wait, just so we're clear. We met in a professional capacity. Erin and I met as, as co-workers. Right. And what a ride it's been since then, Christy. <laughs> but um, I think why this is confusing or interesting to me is, I'm not kidding when I say for the last 15 years, crafted with my own hands saying to her 
I'm confused about why you're feeling this way instead of feeling this way. Mm -hmm. I'm confused about why you're allowing this person to dictate this. And so those things are so separate to me that you're not faking it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it is very true that mm-hmm. it is a, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to wear, mm-hmm. party on, party people in the Yale Library kind of person, mm-hmm. right? But, but. but how it, those that connected yes. with self-esteem yes. is not the same it for is you. Agreed. And here, here's a great example. Um, I say all of, all of those things, and then I act like that. So let's say in the workforce, I do act like that. I'll send, a, I'll send an email that's very straightforward. Mm-hmm. And then I'll have pushback and then I'll call Aaron and go, oh, my God, I totally offended that person. I don't know. I need to apologize. And then I go overreactive. Overboard in the apology. Correct. Yes. Because I think, oh, I came out too strong. I came out too hard because I am a, a, a mold of clay. I am molding. I am learning. I am trying to always be better. So I view my authenticity. I, I'm going to be authentic. But then I'm like, oh, maybe that wasn't the nicest. And so, yeah, I think what you're saying, Christy, that's so interesting to me specifically about Rebecca is that it is not the case that authenticity and being yourself and pushing yourself to the world is always synonymous with self-worth, with acceptance, Mm -hmm. with, you know, being fine with who you are and with an unwavering confidence Mm -hmm. That authenticity and yeah. confidence are not necessarily aligned. And that's what's throwing me off. At least for me. Right. At least for me. And then specifically in the work environment, because my entire life, because I'm authentic and because I show up a certain way, the message I receive is you don't belong here. You're not good enough. You don't deserve to be at the table. You're too wild. But that doesn't make me walk away. It doesn't make me walk away. I still show up every day. I still show up with my same energy. I still show up with my same information, hoping to learn more, but I will never change who I am at my core to make somebody else feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I will not. So what do you make of that, Christy? Well, I, I think that authenticity is ultimately sort of a foundation, but you're right. Confidence is something that can build on top of that. And Mm. it sounds like Rebecca, what you're talking about is a little bit of imposter syndrome, a little bit of not feeling like you're measuring up, maybe a little perfectionism woven in there. And of Mm. course we all, you know, have different displays of our, our little inner traumas that we might've experienced. Mm -hmm. I also grew up feeling like I had to be perfect. And I actually found myself honestly feeling like I wasn't good enough and that I was too much at the same time, which is a very interesting paradox Mm -hmm. because it's essentially uh, between a rock and a hard place and neither direction will help you win that game. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately leaning back into, you know, this self-confidence, it's not that you're confident in every situation, but you're confident Mm -hmm. in who you are. Yes. Right. So different types of confidence, the kind of confidence that radiates out into the world actually comes by showing up and doing the things like it's mm-hmm. like motivation. We don't sit on the couch and wait to get motivated. We do the things and then the motivation follows. Mm-hmm. Same thing with clarity. People often think, oh, I just need to figure out what the whole plan is before I take the first step. But the truth is the clarity reveals itself when you start taking just the very first next step. And so confidence, I feel, is in the same way. You can be confident in who you are and showing up as as the authentic version of you. But that doesn't mean that you're going to feel confident in everything that you do. It's mm-hmm. not that you're necessarily going to feel confident in putting yourself out there. That requires not just confidence, but vulnerability, right? To express yourself in that way, to be seen, to be heard. That's it. It's the accepted. vulnerability. I mm-hmm. do not like that. Mm-hmm. I'm do not right. like to be there. I don't want to talk about it. It's the vulnerability. But, and this is what's coming yeah. together for me. This is yeah. why mm-hmm. we're twin flames. <laughs> because I have the confidence yes. of an effing ox. I know. Even okay. when you shouldn't. Even when I have no clue right. what the hell I'm talking right. about. Right. You will make it up. <laughs> and you will say it in what's such a way in that, that people are like, <laughs> what's going on yeah. in the mall? Yeah, it's a bookstore. <laughs> yeah. Always been a bookstore. Right. You didn't know you that? You didn't know? Yeah. Yes. Okay. But here's what's <laughs> fascinating about this, right? So what you bring to this relationship is I am who I am, and I'm not going to change that to make you feel comfortable. I'm just mm-hmm. 
authentically myself. I have the confidence that says, this is where I'm at. This is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. You can move the heck out of the way. Mm -hmm. And I have thought for the longest time that that was associated with authenticity. I am 85% authentically or have been myself. This journey as I've moved into 42 has been about, are you authentically the person who wants to give until you have nothing more to give? Or is that a byproduct of needing to do the people pleasing? That is the small fine tuning Mm -hmm. is, uh, here's a couple tiny examples. I don't want to meet with the person who sends me an email and says, hey, Erin, we connected three years ago about such and such a topic. How is Concern Center going? Can we connect? My authentic self says, no, we cannot. I'm I'm very busy. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very interested to hear that things are going great for you. Happy about that. But unless you have something that's going to move us forward in a correct direction, I don't have time to chit chat. Mm-hmm. authentic Aaron before this time said, absolutely, here's a link to my calendar, right? And then I'm pissed the whole time I got to have this half an hour meeting because I've wasted the time. Mm -hmm. What have you said all the time? Mm -hmm. No, we're protecting your calendar. You don't have time to talk to people. I'll take care of it, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the other examples will be people will constantly reach out and will say, I need help with this. Can you help me with this? Can you find me a support person for this? I, 85% authentic Aaron, has said, oh my God, absolutely, that's who I am. I'm a helping provider. I'm happy to give of myself to you at the extent of myself. Right. I will stay up until 12 o'clock at night researching therapists for right. your child. Right. And make sure that you have that. Is that authentic, Aaron? No, that's people-pleasing, Aaron. Authentic, right. Aaron says you are capable. Right. Here's a link to psychology today. Right. Please let me know if you've narrowed it down to three therapists, and I'll give you my opinion on those three. So the interesting Boundaries. part. Yes, right? Mm-hmm. Again, off Prozac. So what's really <laughs> fascinating about all of this is that you have had the authenticity all along without the confidence. Yep. And I've had the confidence with the 85% authenticity. The reason it's important for me in this moment to even talk about 85% authenticity is because I'm very clear I was not a fake version of myself pushing that out to people. So similar to what you said, Christy, I am that person who cares deeply at my core. There is no doubt. Yeah. Where it got overextended was in the childhood trauma associated with not being seen, having gigantic feelings that weren't tended to, and feeling yep. like I had to continue to overgive because if I didn't overgive, I had no worth and no value. And I want to be clear that it's not that I don't care. I actually care very deeply, but I learned a long time ago that I have to have the boundaries or I will be up till two in the morning doing all of those things and then not being seen because you didn't follow through with it. And now I'm butter about that. Yes. And reeling and this, that, and the other. And you're down the rabbit hole and you've now lost Correct. everything about what you were planning on doing. Correct. So I learned that way long ago yep. and had to rein it in. So it is it is not that I don't care because I do. Yep. And and what's here's what else is fascinating, Christy. I'd love to get your intake on this. Your take on this. It's not intake. We're not doing an intake session. Here we go. Your take on Everything's this. therapy related. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, now I lost my train of thought. session. Okay. Yeah, so we, yes. yeah, it's a good session. I want your take on this. Yeah, but what was it about? What were we talking about We were about talking about that? me going down the rabbit hole and that I actually do care very She deeply. cares. You care deeply. I have also cared. My confidence has been what has allowed me to get to the place where I am. I think I was going to say something about that. Something along the lines of, it has been my confidence or my clarity around that that has helped us fake it till we've made it. But what's interesting about that is that in this year, 2024, there's an interesting role reversal that's happening where I'm finding myself still confident, but leaning into you more to be like, do I really like to do that? Is this really what I like to do? Is this what I want to be doing? And this is where you coming to that conclusion so much quicker. You will say, we're not taking that phone call. You don't have time to take the phone call. I'm still over here perseverating about the fact, who was it? What was the relationship? Let me go back and look at my notes. Is it worthwhile, right? 
I'm leaning more into allowing you to be the guide associated with that authenticity because, yes, I know myself, but you know me in such a different way. And in some ways, you know the true version of myself better than even that people-pleasing version. Right. And that has been vulnerable yeah. for me. Yeah. The vulnerability I do feel comfortable with is I will put myself out there. I will be very confident. I will tell you that here's how things go. That is very true and authentic. But that vulnerability has also been a guide for us. Whereas for you, you're like, I'm not putting any of that out there. I don't want any of that to happen. Right. It's really, really interesting. How does vulnerability play into this in your opinion, Christy? I I mean, vulnerability is a crucial piece of building meaningful relationships. And like I said, everything is relationships. So this is a really important piece to get on board with. I, I want to touch on a couple of things that you said, because I, I want to offer a couple of tweaks. Number one, fake it till you make it. That's some kind of bullshit. Uh, we shouldn't have to fake anything. We I like to say instead of fake it till you make it, be it till you see it because it is about showing up authentically as yourself, you know, and it does require vulnerability to show up authentically as yourself because chances are, and I mean, by chances, I mean like a hundred percent chance, (laughs) someone's not going to like that, right? Mm -hmm. You make them question their beliefs that they hold about themselves. And it's far more important for them to be right than anything else. And so it really most of the time has nothing to do with you and everything to do with their facing their own insecurities, which is probably why Rebecca is just like, I don't care what other people think or say, because she has already grasped this idea that quite frankly, everyone is just worried about themselves and how they're showing up. And they really actually don't care that much and not in a mean way, but it's not that important. It's not the top of mind. They're top of mind for themselves. So honestly, no one else is as worried about you as you are about yourself. And there is a great piece available in that. The second thing I want to touch on here too, is there's a very big difference between being nice and being kind and being nice. Actually nice means pleasing and agreeable. Okay, so this comes from all this good girl conditioning that we had growing up, being told from the age of two that we're girls that are meant to be nurturing and giving and kind and nice and share and do all of these things if we want to be a good girl. And there's so much pressure for us to show up and be, quote unquote, good, according to societal standards, that we often shove aside that 15% of us that doesn't fit that mold. And so while you're right, we're probably not being inauthentic. But we're also not allowing that that 15 percent probably has to do with the vulnerability and showing those parts of ourselves that someone probably once said isn't good enough or they don't like it or your emotions are too big. But it was never about you. It was actually always about them. We take that. We internalize it and we shift who we think we are because of these experiences and circumstances. So most often, while we believe we're being completely authentic, We're missing the curiosity piece that says, but who am I? Is this the belief that I choose to hold or was this one given to me and I just accepted it, right? And there is a, that leads to a lot of faking it till we make it because we're not sure completely who we are because it's scary. It's risky. It's vulnerable. It might result in more pain. And as humans, we're designed to avoid pain at all costs. So if it feels like it might lead to something really risky, and again, and our brain is usually going off like, oh my God, might die. Like it makes it way more extreme than it is. But here's where we, that we might not show up. bubble. I was just going to say, I have the, in my mind, the best example. Well, let me, let me say, say this. Here's the Rebecca bubble. Here's the Christy <laughs> bubble. Here's the Aaron bubble. And then there's this fourth bubble that connects what, it Scott? all. Well, yeah. <laughs> Scott, Scott is still pissed off back there. Whatever. <laughs> Zero to 14, Scott's angry. Anyway, the, the other bubble is society right. and society's perception. It's not society. Expectation. It's not society. What is it? It's Men? Liberal thinking. Um, liberal thinking? Yes. I can't wait. And here's my example. My example is it, my, my, my daughter, we live in New York. My daughters go to public school in New York. Everything's about fairness, equality, inclusivity, all this bullshit, right? And I feel very strongly about that. 
right down to the fact that my child's not allowed to bring invitations to school to invite certain people to a birthday party because somebody might be offended. Sorry, that's life, number one. Number two, my version of kindness is you need to be nice to everyone. Yes, you need to be polite, nice to all the people in your class. You do not need to like everyone and you do not need to include them in your life. And if we're going to have a birthday party, the kind thing to do is to on the side have conversations with people and not bring it up in front of anybody else who might not be invited because that's when feelings get hurt. We don't need to shove things in your face, but we don't need to include the entire class because somebody's feelings might get hurt. Hmm. Yeah. Nice is like fitting into the mold and doing what you're supposed to do. And being kind is being yourself with boundaries. Correct. And the boundary to me is I'm not going to shove it in your face, but I'm not inviting you to my party because you're fucking weird and I don't like you. (laughs) I'm sorry. That's real. But what is that? What that I don't like saying, you. You're no, fucking no, not weird. That, not that. <laughs> not that part. What she's part? viral. Christy, she's what? viral. Rain her in. What? 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 what part? I'm just trying to give a broad example of how, what but that what difference is. That? Is that that's not society in your mind? That's what? That's society. In in yeah. In school in New York, liberal teaching is we need to include everyone. Everyone deserves to be here. No. Interesting. You don't. Why? But Why are you equal to me, equal to that, equal to... But here is... We the, all deserve to go to school. But here was my example. <laughs> this is, I freaking love this so much Sorry, because... I can't help it. I get really angry. That's your example. My <laughs> example to what you said, Christy, was this. My career in student affairs changed drastically because I was in circles... Liberal school. With particularly <laughs> white men, sometimes it was white women, mm-hmm. which made me irate when it was white women, who could not embrace the authenticity and the realness and the strength that I would bring to the conversations. And so I had to learn and condition myself along the way. That's not going to go over very well and you're going to get a bad performance evaluation. What, if you speak your mind or, or if you have an opinion? Uh, it, yeah, I mean, that's that's an example. Or you need to be this particular way when you're with this person. And when you're with this person, you can be this way, right? And we learn, oh, well, don't, don't do that, right? Be something different. But I got to tell you, I went as far as I did in my career through that awareness and social awareness of the fact that we particularly as women are very much conditioned to happen, have to ebb and weave in right. the societal creation of what it is that we're supposed to be doing if we're going to ever get anywhere. But that's exactly what she's saying. Right. She's saying you're faking it. You're not being authentic. Right. You're calling it. I need to be a certain way in order to progress here, but right. you're not being authentic at all. But you're playing saying, the role. But what I'm saying is, whereas that might be, you know what, Erin, you need to be more authentic. Mm-hmm. I want us to really be clear about that society bubble mm-hmm. that similar to what you said before, Christy, we have to play certain roles mm-hmm. because, not because we're stupid, but mm-hmm. because we're freaking intelligent mm-hmm. and able to manage the systems of oppression that have been put in our paths mm-hmm. as women specifically. Minority women mm. have it worse. I know. Right? I know. And I can, I can hear that and I can see that. And we have to be aware in which that society bubble plays into this whole entire conversation. We can talk about authenticity all day. Mm-hmm. But similar to what you said, Christy, in some ways, the authenticity that we show up as, as manipulative or as constructed as it needs to be, is a survival tactic mm-hmm. because of shit it, that we did not mm-hmm. ask for, mm-hmm. but we have to navigate every single time. But now but we're perpetuating time. the problem. Because you continue to play those roles and you're teaching the and people isn't below that you the balance. Right. Right. Because if Which you is ever why wanna, I got the fuck out. But if you <laughs> ever want to get to a stage where you can have an impact, you have to play the game in some way, shape, or Maybe, form. Maybe. But are you really going to have an impact in that environment? I would say no. I don't know. I would say no. I don't know. Because let's say I was the student affairs uh, vice president. Uh huh. Right. And then all of a sudden I get to a place where I'm sitting at some tables where I'm able to push the boundaries a little bit more than maybe what I have before. Or maybe I start to work for someone 
who is able to hear something more. Mm -hmm. I now have a division of 500 people Mm -hmm. that I can be more of a role model to. For me, I got out before that because I can't play those games anymore, right? And that's not just higher education. There is always a a cost. But isn't this what women are constantly trying to battle with is... How much am I willing to endure? What is that butting up against in terms of our authenticity? How can I still be myself, but also play the game as much as I need to? How do I sit at the table with these people? And then at what point do I decide that I've just given up so much of myself? I've people please so much. Or in my case, I've shut my mouth too much that now I'm like, y'all stupid. I'm Mm -hmm. done. But then maybe, I decide I have to leave and go run my own business. Why? Because ain't nobody going to tell me what I'm going to do in my own business. Correct. But maybe that's where I got way back in high school. I saw that writing on the wall real quick. And I knew I wasn't going to play the games. So I never aspired to even pursue that. I was very, I told, I told you when we were resident directors, I'm like, I never want a title above resident director. Mm-hmm. Even that was too high of a title. But is that because you genuinely didn't want the. Play the game? Yeah. Or was it that you, like, yeah, was it that you didn't want the responsibility associated with having to play the game? Or was it that you just genuinely weren't interested in that? Because what would be sad for me is if you were genuinely interested in that and then you didn't do it because you knew you didn't want to play the game. I do think a lot of If I was genuinely interested in it, I would have played the game. Because that's it's whether that's it's worth it, right? What you do, and right? Exactly. Right. I knew right away this is not worth. It's not worth it. It's not going to give me any sort of outcome that aligns with any sort of values or any sort of desires I want for my future. So I'm real clear that I'm not playing the game in order to be put in these situations. I'm not saying yes to extra things because now all of a sudden I'm put in this in this role and I'm all of a sudden getting different tasks thrown at me that I want nothing to do with. Mm-hmm. I, I I just was very clear about that. Right away. The cost and is I, abandoning I, yourself. And yes, that exactly. And fucking high a cost to pay. Agreed. And so those are the things I'm teaching my kids right now. I mean, my daughter is only in ninth grade and I look at her, I'm like, you can make that choice, but I'm telling you right now, this is how it's going to play out down the road. And if you like that, good for you. Yeah. It's just important for me to be clear that the role of authenticity is not always just as simple as be the person that you are no matter what. Because there are costs associated with being the person that you are, Mm -hmm. for right or for wrong, whether that's you don't get the promotion, you don't continue to move up, you can't continue to stay in the same relationship, your children hate you, right? Whatever the case may be, authenticity is often the goal that we strive to achieve. and. It's important for me to frame authenticity in the context associated with choices, societal expectations, values, to use a word that you use all the time, right? I might be willing to forego some of my authenticity in this small little space because there's a bigger goal for me here, Whereas I'm not willing to adjust my authenticity. I don't want listeners to get the feeling that you're either authentic or you're not authentic. And you're either a lying fake piece of shit who can't get your shit together, or you're so well actualized that you just are constantly authentic all the time. I can't think of one human being in the world that is authentic 100% of the time. That's so not realistic, you know? (laughs) Yeah. I'm just just saying that I think you have to acknowledge that. I think mm-hmm. it's okay to be in the room and be like, I don't agree with this, but I'm going to do it because I know this is what the group wants. Mm-hmm. I think that that's okay. Mm-hmm. I think I that think you just- you're making the conscious choice right. with the awareness Correct. that you are sacrificing part of your authentic being to make Correct. it happen and recognizing the cost involved, which is abandoning yourself. That's and at right. some point you've got to say- this is too fucking much. Generally, if you're resentful, you're frustrated, you're you're ill in any kind of way, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, those are signs mm-hmm. that you have probably gone too far. You have probably, you know, the cost is too high for you. Otherwise, you know, and we do this without knowing. So there is that part of it too. But this conscious awareness that you yeah. have a choice to make, you can conform you can do what you're supposed to do. You could be the good girl or you could <laughs> say, forget that. 
that requires too much of me. And I'm not willing to abandon myself to that extent. And I think that you hit something for me, at least when you said, if you physically feel ill Ill or whatever, I say all the time, in my opinion, 90% of your physical ailments are not actual physical ailments. They're emotions trapped in your body, their reactions to things you're doing, saying whatever. And it's most likely because you were told this is how you need to be, but your body and everything inside you is like, I don't I feel that know. way. Yeah. Right. But you continue moving forward because you're like, but this is what society expects. This is what my schooling expects. This is what my parents expect. And then you have IBS, which to me is bullshit because IBS is not really a thing. It's called anxiety, stress, all these things, and they can't call it anything. Dr. Rebecca in the house, everyone, medical degree. (laughs) I mean, come on, let's be real clear about our medical system in the United States. Here we go. That's the next podcast. I got her all fired up, folks. I'm just I mean, it doesn't up. recognize I'm just the emotional pieces of the puzzle and without, mm-hmm. you know, incorporating the emotional aspects. I don't know how many times you go to a doctor saying you have a concern. They ask you about the physical symptoms. They don't ask you what's going on in your life. Have you Nothing. experienced some kind of trauma? Are you right. going through something extra stressful? No, they right. don't actually consider that. And without nope. considering that, they're not looking at the whole human. <laughs> That's one, right. time, one time, Christy, I had a massive pain in my left butt cheek. Mm-hmm. And if I went to the doctor Mm -hmm. and they said to me what Rebecca said to me, which was, oh, tell me a little bit about the pain in your butt cheek. Mm -hmm. Are you angry by chance? (laughs) Because Rebecca told me the pain in my butt cheek was related to anger. And And it was. I'm walking right out of that doctor's office, just so we're clear. Mm -hmm. Her her chiropractor told her it was from ill-appropriate shoes that she's worn for 20 years, but all of a sudden last week, (laughs) it's bothering her leg. Okay, okay, pay that bill. Let them know that you're getting rid of those shoes. I I say that in jest because I do very much, (laughs) especially as a therapist, buy into the emotional components. But a lot of people don't. With what you're talking about. A lot of people don't. Very much interconnected. A lot of people don't. And a lot of people take a lot of pills and they claim they're helping them, but they're really just becoming addicts to their pills. But... I have I have a lot of feelings about this stuff. You do? I couldn't tell. I have a lot <laughs> of feelings. Christy, she went from zero to 14. Sorry. Scott. Scott. <laughs> I'm coming yeah. over. I'm coming over. I share a lot of those feelings because I really feel like the, the medical uh, thing, uh, all doctors, and again, it's not their fault. They mm-hmm. also got into it to help people, but hey, we don't know what we don't know. And when we're not taught the full picture Maybe because the information wasn't available, maybe because the information just wasn't shared. Maybe it's because we have beliefs in the West that our way is better. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't make it true. It just right. makes it the way that it is. And so I personally have, have a whole human sort of perspective. I think that, you know, I love reading the works of Gabor Mate because he talks a lot about this, about how we are as a Western medical sort of situation missing a lot of really important pieces to the puzzle. And I know that we all believe that it's just a physical thing, but the truth is it's not. There is actually a huge link between people pleasing and cancer uh, amongst other long-term chronic illnesses. And in fact, they've even, they've even discovered that there's lots of Lots of chronic illnesses can be due to neuroplastic pain, right? Which is to say, it's not in your head. It feels real, but the root is something within you that's perpetuating maybe a trapped emotion, something that you haven't allowed to be processed, right? Trauma that wasn't processed properly gets trapped in your body and it does throw things out of balance. Stop your face. (laughs) Show's done. Thanks, it's Christy. Sure <laughs> I think Christy should come Whatever. out next week. Oh, Christy's your new best friend. Good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey guys, I'm going to call her. Right I'm going to call her and process together. everything fact, I want to talk do. about. Actually, yes. that's the best thing that could have happened for me. <laughs> Thank God, Christy. Thank God. <laughs> and I'm not saying I'm not open-minded, and I'm not saying any of these things. And I certainly want people to have their own beliefs and I want them to be different. I value differences of opinion. In fact, I don't think we should all think the same thing. I th- I agree we should have separate groups of people. I th- I don't think everybody should be on the same page at all times. I think How that- boring would it be? Oh my God, it'd be terrible. Oh. It'd be terrible. But I'm tired of people getting criticized or ostracized or whatever because they feel and think a certain way because it offends somebody else. That's fine. And you want to know why you feel like that? Because we're going to get an email after this show that's sure. going to be coming after me 
about all the things I said on this podcast to piss people off mm-hmm. because maybe they don't recognize your voice compared to mine. But whenever <laughs> we get a freaking email, it's, it's always, always like, you did this and you did this and I didn't like this and I didn't like this. And I'm like, I'm sorry, that was Rebecca. But they're like, Aaron did, Aaron did, Aaron did. And I'm like, whatever. <laughs> just hand it to me. I'll hold the shit. It's I'm totally in- fine. So, you know, you just keep, you keep just saying your shit over there. It's totally fine. It'll come on me anyway. I, again, it's not Christy, about that's me. My authentic it's self. about them. That's my authentic self. Christy, it's about them. Out. If I'm, if I'm triggering, it's fine. Yeah, it is fine when and, it comes down to me anyway. <laughs> well, you, you know, know my I'll tell anyway. you what, the truth sometimes hurts and we should all remain really curious because oh, we great. can't I learn agree. and grow without being open and curious. And so if you hear something that is upsetting, mm-hmm. It, first of all, don't you don't have to make it mean anything about you. You don't have to make it mean that you're wrong. It just means that someone sees something differently, right? We're all right. seeing the world through our own very personal, unique lens. Like literally out of 8 billion people, no one else has experienced life the way that you have. We have had similar experiences, yes, but the exact experience that you've had that has led to where you are with your beliefs and your understanding about the way the world works no, that's that's only you. And no one else is going to agree with every single piece. So if you are upset by other things, uh, this might be triggering too. It's your responsibility to look at why that's upsetting you, right? This Amen. is about radical responsibility, taking right. responsibility for the only thing that you can change, and that's you. And doesn't that circle perfectly back to the concept of authenticity mm-hmm. and that authenticity begins with you? And when you notice yourself having a trigger, something's come up, you're ready to write a nasty email, you're ready to be the Karen at the manager station talking about whatever you're pissed off about. If we took a moment and sat with why we were having our own reaction to that instead of firing off why we're pissed as shit about someone else doing something, wouldn't we be in a more authentic, sort of comfortable place? of understanding ourselves better and focused on that path to authenticity because authenticity is not always a beautiful place. I've found a lot of things in my own, uh, uh, I almost said autistic. <laughs> authentic That's a different self, thing. Right? That's very different. Right, right. In our own authentic self that I was not super excited about, that I didn't yeah. love. In fact, that I hated. Mm-hmm. So let's not also think that authenticity is this beautiful, wonderful place of I am who I am regardless, and then I get to be as irresponsible as I want to be with that because you're going to hear exactly what I have to say. Yep. To circle back around to empathy, to more love. Mm-hmm. The goal mm-hmm. is to have curiosity, to your point, Christy, kindness, mm-hmm. and to acknowledge that when we're all in this together and we're trying to figure it out, We are in our best possible place of being able to move forward as changed, authentic people than we are if we want to just sit on our own, you know, island somewhere and decide that I'm most comfortable with this current version of myself and you're going to hear about it before the end of the day. Erin, I want to stir the pot a little bit because I want to challenge your your fitting in and trying to make it work. And I really, really feel like the way to change the world, the way to make a difference, because we can't change anyone else, is to be so authentically okay with ourselves, be showing up so authentically us, unapologetic about it. Now, again, with kindness, with love, with the intention of, you know, living in a world with community, because that's how we are intended to live. But by doing so, you give others permission to do the same, right? That is the way that we can affect change. And so if you're going to a job, not not necessarily, again, this isn't specifically for you, Aaron, but for those out there who are going to a job where they feel like they can't be in their own integrity, they've got to wear a mask, they've got to show up a certain way, they've got to be professional, ugh. they've got to cater to the patriarchy, ugh, even double, ugh. Um, we're not being authentically ourselves. And what that does, and this is sort of what I learned through going through this divorce, this moment of like, I thought I was protecting my kids by staying in this relationship because society told me that it was wrong to get a divorce because society told me that I would have a broken home if I did choose myself. And the truth is, I realized what I was teaching my kids was to settle for less, to put up with bullshit, to potentially grow up and mistreat 
their future spouses in the same way. And I realized the only way I could change that was by choosing myself, by choosing me, going forth, being authentically me, cutting out the people pleasing, putting in healthy boundaries, and being able to communicate those has allowed me to not only leave that relationship, but show my kids by going first, giving them a permission slip and a direct route to creating their own happiness in their life instead of people pleasing their way to the top and realizing they had abandoned themselves to get there. Like that's not a way to create a happy, healthy, peaceful life. And I definitely wanted to show them the right path so that they could create it for themselves. And I think this is the same in, in women. If we band together and we say, forget it, we're, we're not buying this patriarchal nonsense anymore. We're going to start doing things our authentic way, whatever that is. Because you know what? Men and women, we're all we're all unique. We all have masculine, we all have feminine. If we could start recognizing, you know, our unique strengths and even our unique weaknesses, which I think actually are often like our perceived weaknesses are actually strengths. And maybe we've been told that they're no good. And so by embracing and just allowing those shadow parts of ourselves that we may have resisted and hidden away to just be a natural part of our full, whole, authentic self we can find the freedom, right? We don't have to abandon ourselves. We can be free to be ourselves. And by doing that, we give others permission to do the same. And imagine a world where everyone feels free and comfortable and safe to be who they are meant to be. And to me, that's the only way that we can actually find the love that we're looking for. Because if you're not showing up as yourself, you might find people who like and love you, but again, if you're not being who you are, then it's just a matter of keeping up the charade out of fear that you might lose them if you were actually you. I'm 65% in on that. I got to I got to be honest with you and I know that's surprising and it might be surprising to some some listeners. It's not surprising that you feel that way at all because okay. you are indoctrinated into the way the world is supposed to be. This is how this is the game. This is what you do. No, I don't. That that actually wasn't what I was going with. What I was going with is I don't think that authenticity is a place that we arrive. I believe that auth- authenticity, like w- before when you were in your marriage, right, Christy? Weren't you just being it until you saw it? Being be it till you see it, right? It wasn't that you weren't uh, being authentic. I would disagree. You, you I think she was being authentic. I, I think she was being who he wanted her to be. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. Were you not being authentic? You just didn't know what you needed to know. And as you started to come into your own and realize some things a little bit more, then you saw it and then you could be something different. But it wasn't the case in my mind that you were inauthentic while you were in your marriage and then all of a sudden became authentic when you left. Because I think a lot of women could hear that as I either have to be authentic and and focus on myself and do what I have to do and set my boundaries because that's authentically who I am. I think it's a process of becoming, I think is what I'm struggling with. I don't think it's the case that you just all of a sudden are this authentic version of yourself. You don't just always know what authentic is for you until you've had experiences to be able to come into that a little bit more. I think it depends on the person and the journey. I think that at the end of the day, people know who they are. It's willing. It's Are they willing to accept it? Are they willing to dig deeper? Are they willing to go there? Or is it easier to remain in the people pleasing and being what other people need them to be, specifically when you're younger? That right there, what you just said. And I would say that you probably agree with that, Christy, what what Uh, Rebecca just said. I I wasn't being inauthentic. Like I, I don't feel like I was faking it all the time, but I was not being my fully authentic self. So that may sound paradoxical. I was holding back. I was still wearing masks. I was still performing. I was still acting in the way that I thought that I had to and should act to get the outcomes that I wanted. It was, again, essentially a form of emotional manipulation in the situation. I wasn't being fully authentically myself. Again, I feel like there's there's like this authentic and inauthentic, and there's a whole spectrum in between. So maybe, mm-hmm. our, Aaron, maybe I was like 85% authentic. Yeah. And the other 15 was the masks that I was wearing to pretend I was someone other than who I actually was. And Absolutely. I actually believe that becoming is not the word I would use. I get the gist of what you're saying with that. To me, mm-hmm. you are already her. You, 
you are that you are already your authentic self on some layer it's about stripping away and unlearning it's about unconditioning your mind from all of the bullshit that you've bought the stories the, the experiences everything that has changed you away from who you authentically are and if we but can, can see strip that away you, and unlearn you guys saying the same thing no this is how it's different and this is what i love this is the approaching it from curiosity this is how people have really meaningful conversations right because you're not pissed at me christy and i'm not pissed at you no. we can literally just have this conversation you two, I believe, are coming from a place of you're born with your authentic self and you need to peel the onion away to figure out who is that person at the end of the day. I don't believe that. I believe that we are not born with an authentic self, that we become an authentic self through our experiences. That, I think, frames. If you go back and listen to this podcast based on what I just said, you're going to hear it in a very different way because we are approaching it with a different philosophical underpinning about what is authenticity, how one becomes authentic. And I, what I love about this is Kelly up the street had said to me recently, we need a place for this podcast, well, whether it's Telegram, whether it's on the um, Facebook posts that we have, where people can actually comment in and chime in and have these types of conversations. Mm -hmm. This one, for me, feels like we would have so many thoughts and opinions and feelings, and people are like, oh, my God, I get it. Oh, I don't agree with that. Oh, my God, I can't believe you just said that. And oh, I yeah. love that. This is a controversial topic. And and I love it yeah. because this is this is what it's about, mm -hmm. is about not me saying to you, no, 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 Christy, that's not how we do it. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we become our authentic selves. Mm -hmm. And you being like, no, 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 Erin, we don't. We're born with that shit, mm -hmm. right? It's about, cool, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I love how you're seeing it that way. And you and Rebecca, that's why I love, I love Rebecca so much. She believes that to her core, and it leads to some really brilliant conversations. Mm -hmm. But this is why one of the things we're going to be focusing on in 2024 is creating an environment, whether it's on Telegram or whether it's on the Facebook group, where we can have these continual conversations. Because when we do get emails from people who are like, I thought about this, this resonated with me in this way, tell me more about this. Mm -hmm. That's the good stuff. Mm -hmm. oh. That's why we're doing what we're doing. That's why we're because creating these conversations yes. matter. Yes. Right? And Yes. And that's why I, I feel very strongly about creating these groups and these communities, yes. because to have these conversations is so important, specifically for women who do not feel like they can live their authentic selves. And how do they, in fact, we, we both, we both put up a poll the other day about what, what they would like to hear from us if we were to have conversations. And the only people want to hear from, the only topic from me is authenticity. That's it. Mm -hmm. Everything else for you is like thousands of things. But me, it's being authentic because I think it's it's just really clear mm -hmm. and I'm really comfortable there. And I think that other people want to be there so badly, but are more on a pendulum is maybe the wrong word because I don't think people necessarily swing back and forth, but it can feel that way, You're specifically when you're, a per yeah. when you're a people pleaser. And I've just yeah. never been a people pleaser, so I cannot see that. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I think I think that there's That's so great. many schools of thought. And I can see what you're saying 100%. It makes so much sense to me. And I, I can see it from your perspective because I know you so well I and I know you. But I also am very clear that that's not how I'm going to think about I it. Know. And you will not convince me to think about it differently. But yeah. I can see it so clearly from you. And it makes so much sense. Yeah. And I can ride that wave all day and have all the conversations yeah, and be I like, you're it. so right. This this pivotal moment totally allowed you to be the blah, 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 blah. But yeah. to me, but to me, deep down, that's her peeling back the onion and finding her true self. But it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> oh my right. God. It's so, I gotta get you know, that in there. <laughs> it's fine. It's both. It's both. They're both true, right? Uh, you can hilarious. be peeling back the onion <laughs> and becoming at the same time. So yes. why not leave openness for both mm -hmm. and nothing in yeah. this life is either or both uh, and. <laughs> despite yeah. what we may have been led to believe there is no either or everything is an option. Uh, yes. on a spectrum. So if Agreed. you open yourself up to more than just black and white and right and wrong and good and bad, you will see life on a beautiful spectrum of all kinds of possibility. None of them have to be right, right. or wrong. And I actually don't think there's yeah, anything right. that is right or wrong. I yeah, agree. Uh, someone's going to give me flack for that. But given <laughs> well, the stupid. information, <laughs> uh, you know, oh people God. have said, oh, well, I think we would all agree that like, you know, I don't know. I've heard a lot wrong. of people use yes, the I word agree. That truth. Is, 
is not ideal. But, you know, in a grand scheme of things, we assign the meaning of what's right and wrong. And so if we can just leave space for possibility in between, we will find a much more free experience of our life. So invitation to see both. Christy, I'd love for you to join our More Love, the official More Love Facebook group, if you have time, because I do think that some people will be wanting to chat about this or we'll have comments associated with this episode and that will at least be a spot where we can initiate the conversation. I think you'll be hearing from Rebecca and I more as we continue to develop to develop our empathic edge business um, that we started very recently um, that is really talking about the subcontext is empathy with boundaries. Mm-hmm. So I can see you yeah. really fitting into a lot of those conversations. Um, I know you're an international author. I know that you're a speaker. I know that you also have your own podcast, if any of our listeners are also interested. Um, Christy's own podcast is called Create Your Happy, and she is available basically anywhere you can get your podcasts. I know that many of you will be interested in hearing more from her. Um, If anyone would like to get in touch with you, our new favorite happiness hussy, how might they do that? What's their best way to get in touch with you? Well, from uh, everything in one place sort of standpoint, you can find pretty much all the information about all of my books, my podcast, my courses, my programs, all of the things on my website, which is coachchristyholt.com. And of course, all my social links are also there at the very top of the page if you'd like to stalk me in some way on social media as well (laughs) and stay part of the party. Because yeah, I do have a lot to share about relationships and boundaries and people pleasing and all these things are actually topics that I have covered on my podcast this season. So yeah, I have lots to share on the topic and look forward to hopefully conversing with some of the listeners inside of the group. Love cool. that. Yeah. Thanks for thank you spending for spending some time together. Thank you specifically for being here in a way that allowed Rebecca's authentic to be seen. Self thank to you. Come out lot. More thank you for saying me. in many of the other. Um, so we were trying it out today and I think you were a perfect person to try it out with. So <laughs> we really appreciate you being here. This is a really wonderful conversation. I'm sure people will be writing in and I hope you do join our Facebook page so people can comment right at you. Thanks for spending time with us today. It was nice to meet you. Yeah, it was thank an absolute you. blast. And thank you both for being authentically yourselves, because like I say, that's the permission slip that we all need. Stop again. Scott from the bubble. You would have missed all of that if you weren't a subscriber to Even More Love. But in the coming weeks, we're going to tell you how you can unlock all that extra footage, all those extra moments of Even More Love. Just go to themorelovepodcast.com and we will tell you all about it. Now we're going to pick up right here. This is the end of what you would see from the free version. That interview was intense. I loved every second of it. I know you did. It was great. Of course you did. It was every second of it. She spoke my language. Yep. Absolutely. Spoke my language so crystal clear and validated everything I've felt and thought for a long time. What? About authenticity? About uh, people pleasing? About boundaries? About. It, and it's funny because I've said this to you all the time. You always say to me, you're so good at boundaries. And I'm like, if somebody were to ask me what my weakness is, it's boundaries because I don't define it the way you define it. What I heard you say was setting a boundary to you just feels like an extension of your personality. It doesn't feel like a boundary. It just feels like innately who you are. You don't want yes. to take this meeting. You don't want to do this thing because that authentically is you. Right. But I also heard you say that in your mind... The boundary is a negative thing. Are you saying boundary as I understand it is a negative thing? That's what I don't know. Okay. I'm telling you what my brain is saying a boundary is because I don't think it's correct. The way I've defined a boundary, I don't think is correct. Mm. I think it's wrong, Mm. which is why I'm so resistant when you say you're really good at boundaries. I'm like, I don't like that. But you then as I'm learning association I, yes. with boundaries. Yes. But as I'm learning what boundaries boundaries are and as I equate it with authenticity and as you compliment me, it's like I have to redefine and reframe what that is and embrace it and become vulnerable with it so that when I say, you know what, you're right. I do have really good boundaries and not feel bad about it. Do you think and this is going to take us on a little oh, wild journey boy. here, okay? Because to. we're tired. But I don't want to. 
So one of the things that Christy talked about was confidence. And mm-hmm. one of the things that people will hear if they have um, subscribed to our even more love um, subscription pack and received the full interview is that they would have heard Christy say that you might lack confidence, mm-hmm. but feel good about your authenticity. Uh-huh. And I have confidence, mm-hmm. but am in the process of becoming from an authentic standpoint. Yes. So not that you're inauthentic. Correct. Right. right. You're just right. You you're cautious. Right. Because you're so aware of the room and you're so aware of your environment. Right. Yes. So if there's a part of you that says, I don't really know how I'm defining boundaries, but in my mind it really has a negative connotation and I don't like how I feel to that. Mm-hmm. And on the other hand, you're saying, uh, I think Boundaries are just a natural boundaries, whatever they are, however mm-hmm. I'm defining them, negative or otherwise, are just a natural part of who I am. I'm mm-hmm. just clear. I'm curt. I'm direct. I don't want to do that. I won't be doing this. I won't be doing that. Mm-hmm. Do you see a connection between the confidence that you feel that you've been lacking mm-hmm. and in some ways that being associated with the authenticity mm-hmm. of knowing that this is just who I am at the end of the day mm-hmm. and it's not always accepted by people and people might think that you're raw, ragged and difficult to deal with Mm -hmm. and that some of your confidence may in some ways have been impacted Mm -hmm. by the fact that you do have a negative view or a negative confidence feeling associated with the fact that this is just who I am at the end of the day. Well, yes. And now that I'm going to be doing um, a True Colors facilitation Mm -hmm. for a staff, Mm -hmm. I've been you know, reading up and fo- and studying and focusing on um, how I'm going to deliver those kinds of that kind of information. And what's so cool about it, and what I remember loving about delivering it so much, is this idea of a spectrum. And we talked about authenticity on a spectrum. And what's so great about this True Colors personality profile is that there's four colors. So for people who don't know what it is, there are four colors, and each one of us have the four colors in us. It's just a matter of what shines the brightest, what shines the lowest, and what falls in between. And each color has characteristics that are associated with them when you're in a good mood and then they have the shadow sides, right? And so most people are two two bright colors, right? Intertwined. And I am an orange gold. You are a blue gold, okay? Blue is my lowest. Orange is your lowest, which is also interesting because where I shine really, really bright, you really, really struggle and then vice versa. But because of where we We genuinely come from curiosity. We genuinely come from an authentic place. We both hear each other. We both really sit in it. And then at the end of the day, we both decide, is it right for us? And then we both respect where we're coming from, right? Mm -hmm. The challenge with my two, specifically, being a high orange, and orange, just to give some perspective, is um, competitive, spunky, um, off the cuff, flexible, um, creative, um, you know, all of those kinds of characteristics. Doesn't need to follow the rules. Doesn't, and the will guidelines. not follow the rules. In fact, we'll balk the system, we'll question you and not feel bad about it because at the end of the day, it is a curiosity, but there's so much confidence there. Mm-hmm. Gold, on the other hand, is rule bound, structured, family traditions, traditional, will not balk the system, will do what exactly the authority figure tells them to do because that's the way it's done, Mm -hmm. period. So can you see how my two brightest colors are constantly antagonizing each other? But because my orange is my number one, I operate out of that immediately. And then the shame immediately comes in after. So when I say things like, oh my God, that's so ridiculous. I hate everything everything about it. And those people are dumb. I immediately go, oh my God, that was so inappropriate. I shouldn't have said that because they're not really dumb. I just feel that's my reaction. And let me explain myself more. So the shame component is to me what I'm trying to learn and develop and impacts my confidence the most. Because that shame, maybe there's a better word for it, but the only thing I can think of right now is that will immediately come in and start to filter through everything, every single thing I said. And then therefore, any pushback I get, I immediately say, you're absolutely right. You're right. I'm wrong. I never should have said that. And then my confidence goes down the toilet. That would make complete sense to me if I really believed that you were an orange gold. Mm. Oh, you don't. Oh, that's right. Mm. I forgot. I forgot. Okay. So I'm going to remember. So you think I'm a orange blue. Year, <laughs> uh, however long ago. 
<laughs> we, we don't need to I talk about this part. We sure do. No. Because this is directly no. aligned. We, I'm no. driving down the road. dee 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 why are you why are you Mario? <laughs> Here I come, motherfuckers. <laughs> Driving down the road, and I said, Oh my god, I got it. You said what? Because this was after a whole who the hell knows what the heck we were talking about. Who and knows? I said, You're a damn blue. You're a blue. No. And what did you say to me? I you couldn't look at it. you. You stopped looking at me, <laughs> and I'll tell you exactly what you said to me. I don't want to talk about it. I'm in complete denial. You said, I don't want to talk about it. Stop talking about it. That's what you said. Okay? So I don't acknowledge my blue so, self. So, because oh, I'm aware. You just <laughs> described yourself. This is what you just said. You're like, can you see how my orange and gold are really at odds with each other? My orange, which is like spunky and excited. And then you went on to say, and then the shame comes in. You're trying to hijack gold to talk about blue. That's what you're doing. Because you I want to know list. what blue. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> that I don't really follow. Clear, I'm not even positive gold's on your spectrum. Okay. But let's keep calling yourself a gold because you feel better there. Okay. Let's just be real. That okay. I okay. I am not okay. a blue. I do not it's identify fine. with it's any fine. blue because, characteristics oh, at all. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because this is blue, folks. So blue is empathic, caring, loving, can be seen as a people pleaser, cares very deeply about others, wants to make sure that everything is harmonious at all times, wants to make sure that people are taken care of and supported and loved to their core. Okay, and then there's green, which we don't ever talk about because that's the smart people. That's just like <laughs> they're the logical, analytical, crazy, they're, they're, logical they're research oriented. Right? Which reality is, I think you're a blue, blue green. I am a blue, gold, green, orange. Okay, because we're clear that at least my my colors are correct. Okay, but I love, I love. That you just I'm the facilitator, yeah. and we're okay. going to do what I yeah. say. Well, good. Make sure you still pay her to come in, Deb. <laughs> Make sure you pay her to come in. It's great. We are not talking about Listen, me. Oh, we're all done talking about this because you know exactly what I'm about to say. You just said, can you see how difficult it is for me to be an orange gold? And blue's my last. Blue's my last. And every single thing you just went on to describe was shame. What What are you writing down there? <laughs> what are you writing? You wrote, you're an idiot. You're such an idiot. She wrote down on a piece of paper that she's now holding up proudly. I am not listening. <laughs> <laughs> you idiot. Because this is what happens, folks. This, this is the, the real show right here. You know at the end of the day, whether you're listening to me or not, close your eyes. Go ahead. Close your eyes. It's fine. Because if you don't look at me, then it doesn't happen. This is, this is your tactic. I know. That's what I do. <laughs> oh, tell me the name of your business. Just closed eyes. <laughs> okay, you go. You are an orange, blue... And then green and gold are the same number. They're both at the end. Okay? But yeah, I can see why it is challenging to be an orange-blue. I can imagine that that's incredibly difficult. Because everything that you're talking about right now is that you are spontaneous over the top. And you will Even on that podcast things. when you told me to be authentic. So I was, and now I'm having guilt that somebody might be offended. That's correct, Blue. That's Stop correct. It. I'm oh, not. I'm sorry, Blue, don't because identify. if you were really a gold second, you would be like, well, I still don't very much care, but you know what? I'm going to write this to-do list of things that are going to happen in the event that someone responds to me. I'm going to make sure that I do this, this, and this, and You're I'm right. going to get ahead of it You're right. by making sure I go to right. Facebook group okay. and I type this. You want me to keep going? No. Okay, so can I, I hear still you don't acknowledge identify. out loud? You know, okay. Okay. Well, as long as we don't identify Is with acknowledging it. and identify the same thing? Yes, it is. No. Nope. Then... then <laughs> Nope, not at all. I will acknowledge what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. And is I'm just curious, is there any part of you that knows 100% that I'm correct and we're just not going to own that right now? Miss Authentic? It's fine. Eyes are closed. That means yes. <laughs> Boom. Okay. Great. Moving on from that. So, yes, I'm very aware that part of your authenticity journey, as we just talked to Christy about, is the fact that you are orange. There's no question about your orange. You are the person who sits in the podcast. <laughs> you and Christy, you feel a synergy with each other. Yeah, and did. you're like, here we go, everybody. <laughs> I felt really good about I'm it. I'm ready. You feel great about it. I but did. then what happens is you get you going. Open your mouth. <laughs> you get going. And then all of a sudden you're talking about liberals. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're talking about birthday parties at school. 
Wow. And then you're talking I about feel all this stuff. And then you and Christy, new besties over here, which we decided, just call Christy from now on. I please, know. please. She will make me feel better. I know. And she will tell me I I'm know. not a blue. I know. She will. She'll be like, if, you don't, you. if you don't Holding authentically, you know, if you weren't born a blue, then I guess that you aren't a blue. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All I smell is cinnamon rolls. Yep. It's the candles behind That's you. what happens, folks. Change the topic because she's <laughs> trying to get me off the It's hook. distracting That's me. It's fine. Okay. So. All right, fine. Okay. We're still not acknowledging it. I understand. So. I did. That's my way of. Oh, was it? Closing your eyes. I understand. I said, it, and you I said, said it's okay. fine. Okay. That's fine. Are you all understanding, Rebecca, a little bit more here, folks? Do you see the amount of energy that goes into <laughs> the level of awareness that comes out? So what I think is fascinating about that is. We have the authenticity, we have the confidence, we have the fact that when you're talking about true colors, being an orange blue means you're going to struggle with confidence and authenticity because you are constantly second guessing and fearful that you just being you was something that impacted someone in a really negative way. You want to call it gold? I don't care. Same conversation. How did this get turned back on to me? (laughs) You're the one who brought up true colors. I don't even remember what question I asked you, quite honestly. I don't even freaking remember. I just remember I was trying to make some theme between the fact that we talked about you not having confidence, but being authentic. Right. And, and then me I mentioned the shame all the and you defined it as blue. I had all the confidence in the world, but I'm butting into a more true version of authenticity because I believe, as we heard on the interview, that you have to come into your own in terms of authenticity. And so it is not that I'm an inauthentic person. It is that the experiences that I have had are helping me to further develop who I genuinely am at my core. But being a blue for me is so strong and evident. Well, it's also contradictory sometimes to your to your core self. Because what's my second? Right. Gold. Right. Right. So again, you have, and I really am a gold second. It's not like I'm a closet orange second. We're real oh, no. clear on that. Oh no, you're so, you're gold to a T to the point where it is almost detrimental. Yes, but how that plays out is I'm empathic, I'm caring, I'm supportive, mm-hmm. and then my gold has to come in to be like, here's all the ways that organizationally I can support you. I have to go in hook, line, and sinker. I have to take over your process. I have to lead you on the journey. Mm -hmm. I have to be the one who goes into the work environment Mm -hmm. to make sure that we've, you know, reorganized things the way that it needs to. My gold becomes an inhibitor to my blue because I can't abandon ship. I know. If I was a blue orange, I would be like, I love everybody. Ooh, party. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. And so what's really your point about you're leading this true colors activity and that you've dove more into the ways that we all are a spectrum and how these colors play out, yeah. I think is really interesting. And and that to me is related in a lot of ways to authenticity. 100%. Because- Because, it's, it could, because at your core, these are your natural reactions, your natural tendencies. These are who you are authentically and it's how they play out when they're on the spectrum. But help me understand that because I heard you and Christy say Mm -hmm. that you believe that we are born with who we are authentically. So it's the nature versus nurture argument. And the goal is to peel away Mm -hmm. all of those other contexts. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to true colors, mm-hmm. very similar to the Myers Briggs personality inventory. Yes. What we know it's research actually a version wise of it. with is it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. What we know research wise for Myers Briggs was <clears throat> interesting is that over the age of 35, mm-hmm. you have a tendency to see pretty drastic changes mm-hmm. in your Myers Briggs types indicators. Mm-hmm. The same from what I remember about true colors is that just because you are, for example, sake orange, blue, gold, green does not mean that if you don't go and take it 10 years from now, Mm -hmm. that you're not blue, orange, green, gold. However, I will tell you, based on research, traditionally, that doesn't happen. Traditionally, because of the way the spectrum works, you will be in the same colors. You've just fine-tuned some skills or you've fine-tuned some 
aspects of your communication style. Therefore, you just identify a little bit differently, but at the core, you are the same unless you had a tragic event happen to you in some capacity, which would then- Like changed your chemistry completely. Not chemistry, just the way that you communicate or articulate. Well, then that wouldn't necessarily be an authenticity question. It would be a trauma response. Correct. Which is what you you would be thinking who you are authentically is who you are regardless. And if this very traumatic event happens, it's not that you're inauthentically or different authentically. Mm -hmm. It's that you have gone through a traumatic experience and your personification of how that looks looks different. Correct. Correct. So, but at the end of the day, you're still operating most likely out of your authentic self. But if you're if you're trauma response or triggered in some way. Now, the other the other challenge with the particular um, vehicle that you like the test, right, that you learn this from, it depends on how you approach it. In theory, you're supposed to look and identify with certain words and immediately have an immediate response. And you're not supposed to use the filter of work. Oftentimes, people at work operate very differently, just like we talked about. Mm -hmm. You are not always your authentic self because you can't be based Mm -hmm. on your environment. Mm -hmm. So what's tricky when I go into the workplace and serve um, and and, uh, provide this, this workshop, it can become tricky and people will call people out. They'll say, you are not a gold. You are an orange. But some people may identify as a gold because they have to be in that box. But then when you have a you have a personal conversation with them and you're talking with them outside of their role, they are their authentic selves, right? So okay. you have to be really careful about how you take the test. And I try to articulate that very clearly, especially if there's someone in the room who's afraid to be viewed by their boss a certain way or something like that. So <clears throat> traditionally, I had done this with students, um, college-age students who generally are there to really learn about themselves. So it's much more of an authentic response. But when I'm working with um, people in the workplace, it's very different. My, I just had a, somebody reach out to me and ask them to do it for their family so that they can have better interpersonal communication with the, within themselves and their family. But then also their um, kids can start to develop real authentic relationships as they, as they get older. So that's going to be a bit, very different experience than working with people who are in the workforce. So it's it's all in how you approach the test. And then if you sit there and you analyze it and you're like, well, at work, I follow the rules, but at home, I don't have any system whatsoever. You got to go with your gut. Hmm. You know, this is what I think is going to be so fascinating hearing from our listeners about what they thought about the interview right. and how they connect with this. Because would you then say that in that scenario with work, mm-hmm. that that person is being inauthentic? Yes. Yeah. And I would say it's still authenticity. But it's there's variability in uh, in uh, in uh, authenticity based on the environment that you're a part of. It's all authentically yourself. This is the biggest, as we talked about, difference in how we're seeing this. It depends. I think depends on. It depends on the example. So, like, the only, this is so stupid. But the only example I could think of is my boss expects me to utilize our data management. CRM and to go in there and to click off my daily tasks that I'm doing. I'm doing that because I have to, but that's not authentically me. I would never do that. I would never click off my to-do list. I don't even create to-do lists. But you're really rocking that gold. (laughs) But do do you know what I'm saying? So like that version. So that makes sense in a task perspective. Correct. But But now if I'm in a staff meeting. Yeah. And somebody says, hey, we are going to go to all gendered bathrooms in this building. And I am part of that team. And I have a very strong response to that, that I don't like that. But I sit there and I go, that's awesome. Because I'm the team player. But in my heart, I'm like, I am beyond uncomfortable with that. But, that's being inauthentic. But if you sit there and you recognize your surroundings and you recognize <clears throat> in that moment I'm having a strong reaction to this, but this is not the right audience in the right place. And you instead, because they're not asking for people's opinions, they're just telling you we're moving to this typical, this type of environment. And you sit there and you say, okay, is that inauthentic? So this is the part that I'm struggling with. I would say, I would, I would say an authentic person would say, 
I hear you telling us that this is what's going to happen. Is there any room for discussion? Because I'm having a a response to this and I'm uncomfortable. So that's an authentic response. You're associating authenticity with spoken word. That you're only authentic when you're vocalizing no. what it is that you need to be authentic about. Well, and I because would the say, absence of the absence of sharing is agreeing. I don't agree with that. That's what I think is really fascinating. So I don't agree that the absence of just not speaking up and saying how you're feeling. Just like that meme that always goes around that is like, if you know, if you aren't speaking up about anything, you're on the side of the oppressor. I don't necessarily agree with that because I I don't believe it's in everyone's authentic self to be the person who's constantly raising their hand to be like, I don't like that. I don't appreciate that. That needs to change. That needs to be different. And in my own personal self, I notice that I often will go to these types of conversations regardless of the topic from an extreme place of curiosity about wanting to know where that other person is coming from. Right, which is why there has to be some sort of conversation because that person who's authentically responding and having that reaction may not really be having that reaction. They just may be, they need more information. And then once that's delivered and it's like, oh, okay, I can get around that. That makes sense. Or maybe I wasn't clear. Maybe I made an assumption about what you're saying. Maybe to me, an all gendered bathroom is a bunch of stalls that have no doors on them. And now I'm feel I'm just making that assumption. But reality is an all gender bathroom is just one toilet with a door. It's just a what, you know what I mean? Like, so then have you changed your authenticity in that case? Right? Because this is, this no. is what I'm struggling with. I'm having a hard time understanding the process of authenticity mm-hmm. through the process of conversation. In, in, in my mind, the process of becoming authentic is in understanding who you are, who you feel yourself to be in relation to that which is around you. And where you two were coming from was you're born in an authentic way and that it really doesn't matter what types of conversations you're going to have. It's just trying to figure out who you were born as authentically. I think what she was saying when she said you were born, and I don't want to put words in her mouth, but drilling it down, you're born with a personality. You're you're born with certain things that you're that you just are that you just are them. And is personality authenticity? I, in a lot of ways, to me, yes. I would disagree. That's what's so fascinating, isn't it? It's really I don't I know how that I don't know is how a social construct in my mind. Oh no, not even not even close because it's that idea of nature versus nurture. Okay, tell if me how those things are because if related. You, personality is not socially constructed at all. I think that you can stifle. I think that you can train. I think you can do all of those kinds of things, but that's not your personality. That's what you were shaped and molded into being. So you think personality and authenticity are the same? In a lot of ways, yeah. I believe that personality and authenticity are different and that personality is a social construct associated with your authenticity. And you believe that they're one and the same. And you know what? Yeah, There isn't an answer about which yeah. one of us is right or right. If, if one of them has to be right. I think what's fascinating about the conversation is if we can't even be on the same page, and I would guarantee you our listeners fall into, they might even have a different opinion, oh, right? Or a I would love to hear it. Camp. That if we can't even get on the same page about one of these constructs, this, this philosophical term known as authenticity, mm-hmm. but yet we're going to the library to get books about it and we're watching some TED talks on it Mm -hmm. and everything to figure out how to be our most authentic self. Mm -hmm. It's not surprising to me that people are twisted up in pretzels about the fact that they're feeling shame, they're feeling guilt, they're feeling confused, they're feeling defeated, they're feeling excited, they're feeling false sense of confidence Mm -hmm. associated with this construct. And it is a construct. Mm -hmm. It is not, it's like you talked about capital T truth, Mm -hmm. right? Um, A construct of authenticity it, anyone can create a definition for what authenticity is, but isn't sure. it fascinating, ironically, that the true definition of authenticity is whatever you think the term authenticity is for you, right? And so if we can't even get on the same page or if we can't even wrap our minds around and so many things in life come to this total. Is, is that the definition? You know, what's funny. You sent to me that 
speaker this morning through a text. And then when I went down the rabbit hole of what he did, his his background was the definition of authenticity. Oh, that's interesting. So, but I, I'm, I'm interested now to know the actual definition. But I think what's interesting is when it comes to these types of topics and they are in some way associated with how do you live your life? Mm-hmm. How should you live your life? Right? Mm-hmm. That this is where we constantly come up upon the rub of people feeling I'm not doing enough. I'm doing too much. Um, oh God, I'm not there yet. I feel like an imposter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm mm-hmm. feeling right. And so then you have these additional social constructs that are associated with the original concept that mm-hmm. is not necessarily agreed upon uh, by all people. So what we do even as researchers is we op- operationally define a term, mm-hmm. not because it's correct, but mm-hmm. because enough research has been done that we're pretty confident or we we think that this is a pretty generally globally accepted view of authenticity. And Mm. we need that Mm -hmm. because if we didn't, then it would be you versus me versus Kelly up the street versus Renee versus Nina versus all all these people, right? So I just looked it up really quickly. And this particular definition, this is, you're going to like this, I think. It says, to put simply, authenticity means you're true to your own personality, values, and spirit, regardless of the pressure that you're under to act otherwise. You're honest with yourself and with others, and you take responsibility for your mistakes, your values, your ideals, and actions align. Mm-hmm. So I can but I see what you're saying. That topic, though, or that that definition perfectly aligns with what we're both saying. Correct. We're both getting at it from exactly. a different perspective. Exactly. That's what I mean. When you say you're you're building, you're becoming your authentic self because it's your experiences, you're this, how this makes you feel, you're whatever. But, and I guess your personality can be defi- defined the same way. But at the end of the day, when you look back to when you're born, and the only thing I can think of which gave me the biggest aha moment was when my daughter was born. And I remember her acting and doing certain things. And I took her right to the doctor. I'm like, this can't be right. So I took her to the doctor and he looked at me. He's like, I don't understand why you're here. I'm like, well, why is she doing this? And he goes, it's her personality. I'm like, how do I change that? That's terrible. (laughs) And he's like, yeah, good luck with that. So when you think back to when you were just a little baby, were you the type of kid, the type of baby who was able to self-soothe really easily? That's probably part of your personality. Were you screaming and totally a pain in the ass and needed to be catered to all the time? That's part of your personality. Yeah, I think you can mold and and do different things to teach people different things. But what is the core of who you are? I think what's important is to pause for the last moments of this podcast and to ask listeners to reflect mm. personally on what they're feeling right now. Mm -hmm. Because my guess would be there's people who are pissed. (laughs) There's people who feel angry. There's Mm. people who feel, oh my God, I have so much to say about this. Uh There are people who are doing that, snap your finger, you know, (laughs) yeah, girl, you know, I'm here. What's super important about this, which is something that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. is that in order to move into a place where you are most and more comfortable with yourself, it's important to acknowledge that every single way you are feeling right now is valid oh, and yeah. fine. It is also a reflection of you. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to be pissed at Aaron for oh. having a viewpoint that's different. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have... A uh, massive, you know, nasty gram to Rebecca mm-hmm. about how she's feeling. If we all took the time mm-hmm. to feel the beautiful feelings that we're having, the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm-hmm. and to now point a finger back and say, interesting, mm-hmm. what is, what am I attaching to? Why mm-hmm. am I feeling the need to jump through the the computer screen and join into this conversation. Mm-hmm. Why Why am I feeling the need to have my voice heard? Why am I feeling so unsettled about this particular thing? That one thing that so-and-so talked about has me irked. Mm-hmm. That is the beauty of the work. Mm-hmm. And if we don't spend time in the work, mm-hmm. if we don't spend time pointing fingers back at ourselves, if we don't ask ourselves what is coming up for me, but instead we spend all the time being like, I'm going to write an email about that. I'm going to post that on social media. I'm going to make sure I'm going to go on a walk with Aaron on such and such a day and we're going to have this conversation about whatever. 
instead of spending some time really focused on, let me think that through and what does that really mean? That shit's the hard stuff. Well, yeah. And being okay with not trying to convince somebody you're right. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important? You don't need to convince anybody you're right. That's the confidence, right? It's like, that's... I love what you feel you know that what way. What's fascinating about that? If I was listening to you say that right now, I would be like, all you and Aaron have done for the last one hour and however many, including, mm-hmm. is in through the process of the conversation, convince each other. Try to convince each other that the way that you're you thinking think that's about what people, it is right. That, you think that's what people are hearing? Yes. Interesting. Because yeah. that not one time was I like, I'm going to mm-hmm. change her mind. Mm-hmm. But in the process of the back and forth of, well, tell me about this. What do you mean about that? How come this? How come that? Uh-huh. Or, Ugh, I don't like that. How come whatever? It's in some ways this pushing through of trying to make sure I have to feel validated at the end of the day that how I'm thinking and how I'm responding to something feels closest to me. Because if it doesn't, I ain't okay. That's that's the this authentic right? part. Exactly. And it's not until... You stop and say, why am I having a reaction to them trying to convince each other that their side is right? Oh, it's because, and then looking at yourself and figuring that out. If anyone gets anything out of our podcast at all, Mm -hmm. it is what Christy said today, which is it begins with you. The relationship that you have with you is the most important relationship you will ever have. Mm -hmm. And until we've spent the time on ourselves, questioning ourselves, being pissed at ourselves, noticing what we're reacting to, Mm -hmm. we will never be able to get to that core sense, either that authenticity or a natural sense of comfort in our own selves Mm -hmm. to then be present with the rest of the world. My favorite quote says something like, be a flame in a windless place. Mm. And that, for me, is the ideal of how am I so steadfast in being comfortable with the things I like, don't like, and what's okay, that when someone goes and says something on a podcast or someone pushes something on TV or some politician says something, that I am the flame in the windless place. I'm unflappable. Wouldn't that be a windy place? Be a flame in a windless place. But if it's not windy, then you're always going to be bright. Exactly. That's the point. That makes no sense to me. If you're a flame, yeah. stick with me here. Let's just <laughs> take her on a freaking journey here. I swear to God. That makes no sense. If you would want to be the, the flame candle. with the wind that, that combats the wind. What happens when there's a candle in the wind? It goes out. It Therefore, does. And do you want that? No, that's why you Correct. want to be the flame. It's very easy to be a flame in a windless place. I'm all done, folks. There it is, right there. There's no wind in it. I'm all done. I'm all done. I can't. I can't. I loved that. Me too. Isn't empathy amazing? Well, we're amazing. I don't know about all this empathy stuff. That's fine. I accept you wherever you are. Oh, God. I love you. I love you too. And if you love us, Please like and subscribe to More Love, The Power of Empathy podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time.